Matthew, the 27th chapter tonight. Am I on? I am. Matthew 27, beginning with the 26th verse. <clears throat> then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into a common hall, gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. They stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off him, put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you this evening, humbling before the throne of grace, asking you to bless our services here this evening. Bless those that have come this way. And Lord, those that get to see this on, on the internet or wherever they see it, may it touch their hearts today, Lord. Let them understand that what Christ went through on the cross is something that we just cannot fathom, we cannot imagine the suffering that He went through. But we know this, that Jesus Christ went to that cross willingly and died for our sins. I'm asking you to bless our services here tonight. Pour your Spirit out and touch our hearts. Draw us eternally closer to you. For we know that we're just one step away, Lord. When we leave this world, we'll be in your hands. Bless those that could come. Bless those that could not come this evening. For I ask that in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Tonight we're going to talk about a hill called Calvary. Now Sunday, Sunday is what we call Easter, right? And what do we celebrate on Easter? We celebrate the resurrection. But I can tell you this, there could have been no resurrection had there not have been a cross. <clears throat> Preachers love to preach. They preach about Calvary, but we state the fact that Jesus, Jesus' cross, He did not end up in a tomb. He ended up resurrecting. And it is, it is good that each and every Christian should remember Easter, that He did rise up out of that grave. And that is one thing that we need to always remember. All of the other religions of the world worship a dead person. Someone who's dead. Someone who's in the grave. All of the other religions. Today, our God is alive. The cross itself wouldn't even matter if it was not for the tomb, would it? Today, God wants me to point out that the empty tomb was made possible by the cross itself. We celebrate Easter and we celebrate the empty tomb. We, uh, we dress up on Easter Sunday. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I will be dressing up Sunday. I have new clothes. Um, we usually got new dress clothes every year. When I was a kid growing up, we always got new dress clothes. Once a year. And that was at Easter. And you had to be careful because they had to do the whole year, right? And you talk about for a young boy, sometimes that's kind of hard. <laughs> and you know, I love to see people dress up for Easter. I really do. I love it, okay? But can you imagine 
three days earlier at the crucifixion, what would you have been dressed in? Think about that. If you were at the foot of the cross, would you have been dressed up? And that blood dripping down? I don't think so. Do you? In Latin, this hill is called Calvary. In the Hebrew, it's called Golgotha, or a place of the skull. And if you think about it, they use a skull and crossbones to represent what? Poison. But it means what? Lethal. Death. If you, if you take something out of a bottle that's got a skull and crossbones on it, that's lethal. That's deadly. So this hill, the place of the skull, was deadly, wasn't it? Where Jesus was crucified was geographically was not a tall mountain. It was just a little hill in the area. But I can tell you this, spiritually speaking, I believe that this is the highest hill in the world. Spiritually. For us, it was on this hill that God's justice met God's grace. Man's sins intersected with God's sovereignty. Here, history meets eternity. Amen? History meets eternity on the highest hill in the world. Out of all the events that have happened since Adam and Eve and the creation of the world, no event in history has had the significance as this death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those verses that we read, let's... I want to talk tonight some about what happened, some of the things that happened that day. We're going to look at a man named Simon. Simon the Cyrenian. It was required at that time that a prisoner was to carry his own cross. But Jesus had already been scourged His body had been lacerated. But he was, just think of the flesh, how it would be hanging off of him. The big chunks of flesh. And he's already wearing a crown of thorns. And it says that they didn't just set it on his head, it says they drove it down into his head. His face itself by now could not even be recognized. He was repeatedly beaten for hours. And Jesus, all God and all man, His man nature succumbed, didn't it? He collapsed under the load of this cross. The man part. But I can tell you this. They didn't delay the crucifixion. They didn't give him a chance to catch his breath. They wanted him dead. And they wanted him dead now. So what do we find they did? The Roman soldier quickly drafted Simon, a first able-bodied man they come to, carry his cross. Simon by name out of the country of Cyrene, which was a country in northern Africa in today's modern times, it would be, would be Libya today. It's possible that he was a black man. We don't know for sure, okay? It's possible. But more than likely, it says that this area was settled by Palestinian Jews. So it actually could have been a Jew that had come to celebrate Passover. Anyway, that was on the side of the street. And we know that the Roman soldiers just grabbed the first one they thought that could carry this cross. The Bible says, 
He was compelled to carry the cross. He was compelled. They made Him do it against His will. He wasn't there to carry any cross. He was there just watching, along with the rest of the crowd that was there. This cross was the ultimate degradation of a human being. The crucifixion in itself, or this practice, actually originated from the practice that they would take and nail rats to a wall and watch them die. They thought it was fun. But it soon became their supreme method of killing. But it was for killing only the worst criminals. Think about this. It was for the worst criminals. They didn't do it to just ordinary. This was not the common for just ordinary prisoners that were capital punishment. This was for the worst ones. It said that during that time you never even talked about crucifixion. People would not even talk about it. Can you imagine Simon's, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. That's what I would have been doing, wouldn't you? I don't want to do that. But it says the Romans compelled him. You can imagine his humiliation, his resentment of having to do this. Being associated with what? If it's crucifixion, it's one of the worst criminals that ever was. Mark refers to Simon as though actually he was part of the early church. And they would have known by his writing who they were talking about. It says in Mark 15, 21, and they compelled one Simon of Cyrenia who passed by coming out of the country of the father of Alexander and Rufus to bear his cross. And there was actually, uh, in Romans 16, it even mentions a saint by the name of Rufus. So many Bible scholars believe this experience of Simon's may actually have led to his salvation of him and his whole household. Perhaps he went to Jerusalem to sacrifice a Passover. The Passover lamb. But he would end up meeting the Lamb of God on the way to the crucifixion. <laughs> He's an example of those who come to church because for some reason they were made to. Now none of you were ever made to go to church, were you? Hmm? When you when you was a child, you, you never were made to go to church, were you? It's for those that were made. This is an example of a person who was made to go, made to do something for the Lord, and it ended up getting saved. There's been many who were made to go to church but they listen to the music and, and they get their hearts get touched and they listen to the preaching and they get under conviction and the next thing you know, they get saved. Amen? And then that making is no longer made. It's I want to. I'm sure that particularly teenager, children, and when I was growing up, I didn't want to go to church. And of course, if you were at the, at the churches back then, uh, James knows what I'm talking about, uh, the old Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, they used to make us go. And I hated it. I really did. Because you had to sit in that pew and you could not move. Your mom was sitting there right next to you. And if you moved, guess what? You were in trouble. So I didn't want to go to church. I was, I was made to go. If you're here when you was a kid, and you, how many of you is in here when you were a child, you, you had a drug problem? 
Amen. Huh? You, you were drugged to church. You had to go. Amen. Yeah. How many of you, though, were drugged and now you're glad you went? Amen. It doesn't matter how you get here. The Word of God is still sharper than any two-edged sword. So bring all you can from the fields, from the outside. Bring as many as you can. Bring them into the church house. The Bible will convict the heart. Not me. Not you. It's God that will take care of that. It's your job to get them in here. It's not your job to change them, to save them. And what did the Bible say? Compel them. Go out into the hedges and compel them to come into my house. Compel them. A lot of parents will tell you, well, I don't want my I don't want to force my kids to come to church. I, I just I don't want to do that. They'll just get turned off and, and won't want to come. Let me tell you. Make your kids go to church. I've heard somebody say, well, you can't make them go to church. Yes, you can. I found that out. We made our son. And when he was at home, now when he was in college and he was away from home, not under our care, I couldn't make him. I tried. But when he was at our house, even as a young adult, had to go to church on Sunday. Okay? And now look where he's at. He's a deacon. He's a Sunday school director. He's a pianist at church. We made him go. They'll say this. Well, I want them to get old enough they can make up their own mind. No. No, make it up for them when they're young. I've heard people say, well, I I used to make them go to church and now they won't go at all. Well, if they did, when they're out of your your range, you can't do nothing about that, okay? But as long as you're in your house, I, I... and I've, I've used this example before, and then when uh, I noticed that Dora's mom and dad, now I mean they grew up in church, had to go to church. As soon as they all got old enough, all of them for a while, including Roy, including Norma, didn't go to church for a while. But then, guess what? It came back. That, that was implanted in their hearts. And you cannot stay away from God's house. You say, well, they quit going to church. They, they won't go to church now. And it's because I made them go when they were kids. Can I tell you this? That's a bunch of baloney. Amen. Amen. To use that Greek word, baloney. If I thought of the things that my mom and dad made me do when I was a child and I gave them up now, you know, mom made me take a bath. What if she hadn't made me take a bath? I didn't give up now. Amen. The Bible says train up a child in the way they should go. You do that. Joshua said what? As to me and my house, what? We're going to serve the Lord. If they go a different direction after they leave your house, you can't do anything about it. That's their decision. Oh, you get some. They may have had a bad experience at church. And I... I don't know how to address that, really. Because human beings are human beings and you're going to have to deal with it. 
We've all had bad experiences in church. Something we didn't like. But you know something? That wasn't God's fault. We can't blame Him. But people will. They'll, they'll blame God and quit going to church. You can't do that. It's not God's fault that people act the way they do. So we looked at Simon. Well, let's look at the soldiers for just a minute. Verse 35 and 36, and says they crucified him, parted garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lot. And sitting down, they watched him there. Now, wait a minute. This, these are hardened soldiers, right? This is their job. They've probably done hundreds of these, for all we know. We know under the Roman regime that there's a lot of crucifixions and a lot of execution. So they've probably seen a lot of them. Can you imagine one of them sitting over on a suit, fool somewhere eating an apple while this is going on? I know that's callous, but it's the truth. I mean, they've been doing this so many times. Uh, I, I get so... I, I watch a, 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 one of these crime scene shows on television or a movie, and they'll show the... The, 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 the coroner sitting in there eating a sandwich, you know, and there's a dead body in there. And I'm thinking, no, no. But I mean, this was the way the soldiers would. They had seen so much of it. They didn't think nothing about it anymore. Here they are sitting around playing a crude game, hoping to win something from this crucifixion. This was just routine for them. Imagine one of them sending and telling jokes. <laughs> but look out. Look out. Christians, we have heard the story of the cross so many times that we too become desensitized. It doesn't affect us anymore. When we read about the crucifixion, there ought to be tears in our eyes for what Jesus Christ suffered for you and I. We hear about it and we let it go right over our heads. Amen. We hear it being preached and sometimes we have a hard time staying awake. Wow, what a disrespect. That is spitting in the face of Jesus Christ. Our eyes are dry, our faith is old, our hearts are hard, our prayers are cold, we're callous, the frozen chosen, and God help us to light a fire under us. We need a fire. We do not realize that we should have been the one that was crucified, not Jesus. He didn't sin. We did. This was our sins that was laid on Him. That were, they were our, are the soldiers in this. We are the soldiers in this scenario. We need a fresh look and a fresh love for the cross of Calvary. In the light of the cross that we see Pilate's cowardice, we see the chief priest and their hypocrisy, we see the disciples' lack of faithfulness, and we see the soldiers' callousness. So what does the cross reveal about your heart tonight? Search your heart inside. What does it, what does it show about you? Calvary's Simon, Calvary's soldiers, and Calvary's suffering. Go down that 39th verse. And says that they passed by, reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, all the chief priests mocking him, with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he will have him, 
For he said, I am the Son of God. Hmm. The Gospel writers themselves, they didn't get as graphic. When you read this, it, it's not as graphic. You have to imagine. You have to bring it out in your own mind of what they are really saying. <sighs> to be crucified was to die a thousand deaths. Isaiah said, you could not even recognize a man. If you saw him, you couldn't even recognize that it was a man. That he was beaten so much. Perhaps the only word that begins to tell the story is the one I used recently when we were talking about hell. It was excruciating. Everything about it. From the beatings, from the the mocking, everything would have been excruciating. The hours on the cross after he'd been through, the scourging, the beatings, the thorns, the nails, those hours would have been excruciating. Hanging on that cross, trying to pull himself up to get a breath, a breath of air. Because without that, he could not breathe. Think about it. Pulling up through those nails from those nails in your hands. We see in verse 34 here that they offered him a type of narcotic to help him in the pain and he refused it. Jesus refused this. He did not want the pain to be dulled. And this was a public display. Think about this. Anyone could come out and watch it. When they hung Saddam Hussein, they at least had that in a private room, didn't they? Or when they shot uh, 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 the, what was that leader, Bin Laden, they faced a quick, easy death, didn't they? But this would have went on for hours. I don't know about you, but if I was Jesus Christ, I would have come down off that cross and I would have took names and kicked butts. Amen? Amen? That's us. That's human being. That's human nature, right? But then we're talking about the Son of God. So what held Jesus Christ on that cross? It wasn't the nails. It wasn't the Roman soldiers. As Betty says, it was love. Love is what kept him on that cross. The cords of love bound him up there. And shouldn't this story in itself tell us that we need to go all the way with Jesus Christ? We don't need to be a, a Sunday Christian only. We need to be a Christian all the time. Don't be a person who just happens to get saved. Make Him everything. Give Him everything, including, first of all, your faithfulness, and you need to do it all year. I love it. Usually at Easter, we have a good crowd. Amen. But that should be all year long. Every day. Said a preacher was studying late into the night one night, preparing for his sermon about the cross he said he fell asleep and while he was asleep he had a dream and he dreamed that he saw this this resurrection or he saw this crucifixion and he followed it all through through all of the steps the beatings and he saw the crown and he saw the blood and he saw Jesus and the way that he was beaten and he went all the way up to the cross with them and and they were Put, the, put him on the cross and they raised it up. And there was a soldier at the foot of the cross standing there looking up. And he reached up and got the, show, the soldier by the shoulder, turned him around. And he said, that's when I woke up because it was me. It was me standing there. I was the one that crucified Jesus Christ. I like that song. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it what? Causes me to what? 
tremble. Amen. And then he died. And when he died, guess what? That clock started. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. It wouldn't be long, would it? You could count the minutes. They could have counted the minutes in between. For in just a little little while, with that clock a-ticking, the Father's going to reach down, raise His Son up from the dead, and through that, it promised that you and I could have life also. Hmm. Don't allow the death of Jesus Christ to go in vain. If you've never been saved, get saved today. If you're saved right now, and you're not living right, start living right. Amen? Get back into church. Don't be the one that's spitting in the face of Jesus Christ. Don't be the one of the soldiers. Don't take it lightly. This is serious. Our salvation come at a high price. But I am so glad that Jesus Christ was willing to pay that price. And He did it out of love. When He was on the cross, I was on His mind. Everybody stand if you would. I saw the weather forecast for Sunday and it's supposed to be nice. Saturday's supposed to be very cool, but it's supposed to be nice again on Sunday. So be here at 7 o'clock and we'll, we'll watch the sunrise and we'll have a wonderful service outside. Anyone got anything on your heart? Anything before we close? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And it's always really got me just reading in the Bible what it what Christ went through and everything. And right. I told him, I said, I just don't know. And he said, Well, if you don't have to go, then I said, Yeah, I'm going because I'm going to support the church and they're going. Mm-hmm. But when I could not look, I just had to close my eyes. I could not look. You know, right. And then what they did. And I realized that was just the people asking it out. Right. Right. Yeah. The uh, some of the things that we were talking about, I reading about that some of the things that they left out of the Passion of the Christ, and the fact that this brought the possibility of salvation for all mankind, they they kind of failed to picture that, you know, and and so anyway, but that's Hollywood, amen. Anyone else? Yeah. Mm. Roy, dismiss us, please.